authentic anthropology brought to life through popular culture, but behind the prosthetics and CGI lies a world of science and forensics that are used to help identify the dead. The role of a forensic anthropologist is to assist the police in a case where there's a suspicious death. A forensic anthropologist is called in when human remains have become skeletonised, and our job is to come up with a profile of the deceased by looking at the skeleton to find out the age, sex, ethnic background and any individualising features of the skeleton. Each anthropologist trains for years in their field and their studies begin as an undergraduate where students like Rebecca Platt face a future that sees them come face to face with the most decayed corpses. Forensic science means science of course, so doing anthropology which means the study of the skeleton uh, and you're doing it for a police matter than it is in effect forensic anthropology. Students who do forensic anthropology at university are usually qualified to go on to do a master's in forensic anthropology if they wish to follow that field. You can't just go and be a forensic anthropologist with an undergraduate degree. For example, we were going to uh, try and decide what sex a person was from their skeleton. Clearly this is a teaching specimen, this is a plastic specimen. When you're in the field, you don't get the whole thing normally because elements have been lost or rotted away or destroyed. But I'll just show you the key points. We start with the skull. Um, you can see above the eyebrows here you've got this kind of ridged area. Yeah. This would indicate um, that it would be a male. Uh, females rarely have that kind of um, ridgeness on the eyes. Um, here on the mandible we see that the corners are stuck out and the, the base is very solid. Again that's a male trait. Um, the eyes can be squarer in males than they can in females. And on the back of the head, not very well expressed on this plastic one, there's a knobbly beaky bit here, which is called the external occipital protuberance. Now, women don't generally have that. Right. So that's how we would determine a male from a female. But it, I should say that it's important to have a clue also on the ethnic background of your skeleton, because all of the things that I've pointed out vary in their intensity uh, between the different population groups. Yeah. So normally you would know that depending on where you were digging or depending on other parts of the skeleton. Mm -hmm. The most important part for sexing though is the pelvis. Um, there's a number of things on the pelvis that can tell you the difference between male and female. The V shape that's created by the bones coming together here is a much tighter V in males than it is in females. And most importantly, this shape space, that's where a big nerve goes through. And in males, it's quite tight like it is here. In females, it's a much broader angle so that the nerve's got more space to get through. Right. So when you're carrying a baby, it's got more that it can sit on without trapping your nerve. Yeah. Rebecca will continue to study in an advanced postgraduate level before she can become a fully qualified forensic anthropologist. <laughs> Oh, my God.